going to move on to the next question. And uh, uh, let me just, I, I just uh, wanted to jump in. Tabalu, I think that you made a really good point, which is about staying in your lane. And you have uh, expertise in a series of accomplishments from the Obama administration on bridging that gap. I, I, I don't have that um, knowledge or space, so I, I, I commend you on that. Ledette, before we move off of this project syndicate article, because it was obviously very well thought of, it was obviously written to reach out to the international community with the EU um, freezing aid and the Biden administration coming in. And I just wanna go back to what I said earlier and what um, Mel said, because we are looking at how we can all be helpful and to intervene. And I go through the article I've been reading again while we're sitting here, and um, what I don't see in it is what the Prime Minister's plan is to de-escalate and again to put a path forward that, ha that opens the opportunity for a Biden and a special envoy and the international actors that, uh, that Tabapu talks about who have vest in the area, whether it's the Gulf states, the Russians, the Chinese, et cetera, to be able to put that platform together versus waiting for that platform to be put together by others. And so I guess I would say if I were looking at, I were looking at how to move forward, that's what I would be thinking about. Not, um, you know, it's defining good guys and bad guys. I mean, that's all gonna be dependent upon the facts that you put out. It's gonna be dependent upon the timeline of who did what to whom. But right now I think we're beyond the facts and so much is at stake. And so if, if people are gonna come in and rally in the world to see what they can do to really support the country at this critical moment in time, what is the leaders themselves put on the table? And I think that's, you know, again, I would, I would come back to that in terms of uh, what the advice was. When we were looking in at Liberia in 2002, and this was uh, when the Bush administration had just uh, come in and there was so much happening after 9-11 and with Afghanistan and Iraq. And my advice at that time to the Liberians who were convening in, um, in a neighboring, where were they convening in, I think Burkina Faso at the time, that if they wanted the international community to come in to bring in a peacekeeping force to provide the level of assistance and support that they wanted for the country, they had to show that there was a path forward. And again, that's kind of uh, where I'm uh, coming back again, just uh, to Bob, who, as you said, you're st you stay in your lane. I mean, that's kind of mine in terms of what it takes to build the prioritization that it's gonna require because it's not just about de-escalating the conflict and bringing peace and allowing real national elections to take place, but it's about what it's gonna take for the economy to recover, for the region to recover, type of infrastructure, health security that's gonna come in, and that'll be based upon a return on an investment. Mel, I just wanted to put that back over to you because I'm just pivoting to you. I think it's an important point. I think that, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're Ethiopia in a real uh, trick bag right now. And, uh, you know, ethnicity is a big part of it. You know, on the one hand, Ethiopia has a beautiful culture, you know, and Ethiopia and anywhere in the world, uh, there's something about them that uh, they are, they, their pride that uh, you won't see anywhere else in the world. But that same pride is what's getting us right now, you know. Uh, I'm looking at, uh, you know, you talk about, uh, uh, you know, Tababu, you, you're talking about an outsider influence. Sure, they're looking at Ethiopia and saying, you know, you got Ukrainians, you got Russians, you got Chinese who are going to Ethiopia and say, oh, look what the Tigray has got. They got tanks and, and bazookas and so forth. You need to buy them. You know, buy them from us. So you got these weapons that are coming in from Europe, from Eastern Europe, from Russia, China, and elsewhere. You got the Americans, uh, the, the Trump administration basically told Ethiopians, you need to build up your defense forces and you need to buy new weapons. Of course, buy them from us. And I have a good friend who can sell you that. They don't care anything about the people who are dying. They don't care about the women, the children, the people who are dying. They just want you to buy the weapons, right? And so uh, I've seen these guys go from one side to the other side. They go talk to the Eritreans, then they go talk to the Ethiopians to get them both competing to buy weapons. And so, uh, you know, how are we gonna get out of that? 
I want to say something about uh, the special envoy, and I was going to say something about that. You know, uh, Ethiopia has a lot of good friends who are in high places. I'm thinking about people like Ambassador Michael Battle, Ambassador Ruben Brigady, you know, who served as a U.S. ambassador to AU in, in Addis. You got a lot of these people who have a lot of influence about uh, with the Biden administration. Uh, you know, but how are we going to use them if we come in here to try to divide them up and get them to take one side versus the other side, uh, all they're gonna do is throw up their hands and get to working on South Africa or Nigeria or other, other, other areas because they don't see any way that they can really be. Uh, I'm worried about the special envoy because I know that the various sides in the region are just looking to eat that person up. You know, They just look to grab that person, pull them to their side, it's our way. Um, you know, right now, uh, the, the African Union has agreed to, be, to mediate the dispute between Ethiopia and Sudan. Why are, why are we having a dispute between Sudan and Ethiopia right now? Neither one of the countries can afford any kind of a war, you know, especially in the time of COVID-19. So I'm looking at this and saying, really, the ball is in the hands of the people in the region. You know, the Ethiopians, the, the Eritreans, the Tigrayans, the the Sudanese, you know, we can only be supportive, but we cannot determine the solution. The solution is with the people. I'm sorry. We're running out of time, so I just want to continue to our next few questions real okay. quick. Sorry. Um, um, so my next question uh, is, uh, takes us to the actually to the solution side that uh, both all of you have actually mentioned. Uh, Riva, I'm going to start the question with you since you are in conflict uh, uh, resolutions and uh, where do you see Ethiopia or how do you see us uh, transitioning uh, and which would be which way would be best? Hey, Ledette, can I, can I, um, can I ask, can I, can I, because um, Mel was on a roll there and Mel was moving in that direction. <laughs> can we turn it back to Mel? Uh, let me, you know, let me hear what, what he says, giving his experience, and then I'll pivot back to the experiences that I've had in places like Liberia or South Sudan or Sierra Leone. So, so, so Mel, uh, over, over to you. Sure. Um, you have, uh, you've uh, already uh, started it, so we're just continuing that. Yeah, I'll keep it real short. Uh, but I just want to say that the, the solution is with Ethiopia and the people in the region themselves. Uh, we can be, uh, you know, you have a lot of friends here in Washington uh, who really want to help, you know, but it's going to be up to the Ethiopians to come forward uh, with some recommendations. I mean, I would like to see some sort of a peace conference going on uh, in Ethiopia <clears throat> between the, the very warring parties. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, you know, then let us buy into that. But, you know, you got to take the lead yourself and allow us outsiders to support you. Over. Hey, hey Ledet, I, I would I, I would agree with that, and I think I did run ahead of your of your um, uh, of your uh, questions. I think what um, what I would like to see from the Prime Minister, for example, and again looking at what he said so far, is is being able to um, convene that type of conversation and put um, the least common denominators together that could bring people around the table, both asking for concessions on one side and putting concessions on his and dealing immediately with the access to the humanitarian um, corridors. I think if something like that was able to be put together within Ethiopia, then the international community would rally around and build the trust and, and help provide that confidence and the support that's required to move, move forward. And as Mel said, it, it's the people who he mentioned, but also you know, you've got uh, Tony Blinken at state, you've got Linda Thomas-Greenfield at the UN, you've got people who have spent a lot of time in Africa and have a passion for it and have the same energy and belief that, um, that you all do about its uh, potential. So the people are there, but the solution's gotta come from the Ethiopians. Now, I'm not a super fan of some of the regional negotiations going on. I watched it roll back and forth in, in South uh, Sudan. I, I think that there's so much capacity within that country to move forward that it's really up to the Ethiopians to put that um, together. And then once that happens, if you do have a special envoy, you have a special envoy that's pivoting 
off of what the consensus is in the country. I also believe part of that consensus has to be legitimacy through elections. The national elections were postponed from COVID-19. That actually was the spark that created this flame of instability because in the Tigray region, they decided to go ahead outside of a national context. So um, again, I'm with uh, Mel that there needs to be that type of outreach and there's an exhaustion with that of who did what to whom, who started what, who's bad, who's, who's good. Mel was spot on when he said this envoy is gonna come in and people are gonna be knocking the door saying, choose me, choose me. But there's no choose me here, you know? There's, there's a solution that's going to be, um, there's gonna be workable. And so I think that that's where people would like to go. And then you go back to what Tababu said is that we have this US Development Finance Corporation. We have a, a baby step of the Trump administration on Prosper Africa, which didn't really get off the ground, but did define a relationship based upon economics based upon trade based upon the ability to transfer skills and capacity all of us want to look towards that and to what tababu is doing as the focal point of our effort but the stability has to be there um, there first and so again what i would say based upon the experience that i have if, the, if there's not leadership within the country if there's not an ability to um, to compromise and for each side to be able to build confidence, and there's very little that the international community can do to come in and to define, you know, the next path forward. Yes, I'm so inspired by the two, the comments. Uh, I'm gonna quickly jump in. I'm going to stay on my lane of leveraging the power of business and providing the African immigrant and the African diaspora an invest an investment opportunity to create wealth while they make a difference on both sides of the. I see problems on both sides. Uh, here in my uh, my community, there is an economic injustice. There is uh, a whole lot of hardship, and so. Even the community-based economic development for the brown and the black people in America is also vital and important. So I'm gonna stay on my lane and, and, pro, and preach benefit cooperation for Africa initiative, promote the model. And so we can address poverty leveraging the power of business because I believe uh, most of the problem significantly uh, currently and in, in the past is because the international geopolitical economic order that's not fair and geared towards against uh, the, the, the vitality of African growth. I really do believe that. Uh, but I think we're all uh, in, the, in the position of service in our lane. You know, uh, yes, Melvin, Brother Melvin, you're right. Africans have to take responsibility. And you are an elder, you've been there from day one. And you should be in the table and say, you know, hold second. You know, you can chastise them. You can bring them to own the problem. There has to be a track to make sure they take responsibility. And then, Sister Riva, I see, um, I see you talking about logistics, infrastructure, and a strategy, and, and detailed engagement. And, and then, as Brother Mel, you know, bring people to the responsibility, you can also shape the conversation by putting action-oriented strategies and, uh, to make sure uh, African leaders and African you know, players uh, take uh, the responsibility and address their own challenges. But I do say, with that said, at the end of the day, everything, every political social problem, when you cut through it, it's an economic problem. An economic problem that has been existing for a long time. We cannot dismiss that. In fact, to me, the problem is poverty. If I can show my brothers, uh, African, African brothers and sisters, problem in Africa, is the issue of economic empowerment, and they can they can come to the global market, compete, leverage the power of social business, create wealth, live an African dream in America, create wealth here and there. Africans will come together because the minute they know uh, poverty is an issue, and the solution is in the global scale. You know, let me give you a quick uh, example. When you go to Starbucks and pay two dollars and fifty cents for a coffee. The green coffee, the, the payment from that 250, 10 cents goes to the green coffee. 
10 cents, significant part of the coffee is coffee. 10 cents go to the, the bean. Out of that 10 cents, only one cent goes to the farmer. The barista who will serve you gets about 25 cents. That is the international economic order we work with supporting on a daily basis. That makes it very difficult for Africans to go beyond the immediate crisis and find their neighbor to blame. Okay, so we cannot dismiss that. That is the case about Africa, as I said, from colonial time. It is resource extraction. Do you know, it's sad to know, the intra-Africa trade is only 15%, because the physical infrastructure, the custom and, and the language has been dismantled and put together by the colonial power. Now African Union is trying to work on it to increase intra-Africa trade. I was in Djibouti 2000, 45 minutes flight from Addis. In my hotel, I drank Nestle coffee. That's an insult, you know. So we, ha we all have the position of service. You know, we have our own roles. Africans have a responsibility. You know, let me leave you with this figure. Right now, Ethiopians are about a million in the U.S., so second and third generation. By the way, since the 1980s, the best of Ethiopia has fled and has come to America. The doctors and the engineers paid, education paid by the Ethiopian people, Ethiopian people are making America great. The brain drain, you know, I, was, um, I, went, I, I wanted to tell my former president, um, Africans have come here, made America great, you know? So all these Ethiopians who have, were here making, I mean, pursuing the American dream, all their country to pay back, there is no any other place where you can get your education is paid by the government and you live free without paying it. You know, every person who went to college here pays their 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 their, their loan. And so, if I can um, inspire one million Ethiopians to invest and consume ten thousand dollars a year, that's ten billion dollars towards the, the the scale up of the. The, 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 the social enterprise that can create wealth while making a difference. Ethiopia, 110 million people, they are only, they are only getting $3 billion a year, 110 million people, because they, go, they get that, leak, that, that cheap price for the community they, they bring to the marketplace. So we all have a, in the position of service. Policy has to be there. Africans and Europeans have to take responsibility, but we cannot dismiss the impact of the international geopolitics. You know, during the Ethiopian Eritrean War, I was listening to the, on an NPR, I was listening to the debate of the Security Council at the, Uni, at, at, at the United Nations, trying to put an embargo, arms embargo on both countries. The debate was, most of them, eight of the 15 countries at the Security Council were selling arms to both countries. And they didn't want to stop the war because putting an embargo means you know, cutting the money supply. You know, this is an ugly, you know, we have to be very honest and bold. The international geopolitics has appalled on us. So in short, uh, I want to stay on my lane again, leveraging the power of business. I want to build a bridge between the potential in Africa with the massive human capacity investment power of the African diaspora community, $3 trillion. Right now, the purchasing power of the African, the African American community is enriching Europe because we're consuming their product, you know? And so uh, to me, yes, Africans have to take responsibility, but the, the African diaspora has to invest, has to leverage this power of investment and purchasing power, create wealth and make a difference. That's where at the end of the day, the economic, the economic underneath is very, very significant. And in the meantime, the conversation has to be laid with a strategy. And I can see, uh, Riva, you can, you, can, you can also contribute in that context. Thank you, Dababu. So uh, we're running out of time. So I want to give uh, one minute each. <laughs> Um, just uh, your comment in regards to the uh, GERD, uh, the Nile. Um, as we all know, this is a public uh, project uh, by Ethiopians. 
and it's uh, obviously um, uh, having a lot of uh, challenges, but this is also something that's going to change uh, the lives of uh, Ethiopians uh, um, and uh, a significant economic uh, uplift for the country. Uh, Ethiopia's stand has always been, uh, let's uh, share the resources, um, but uh, uh, as we know, uh, we are um, facing some challenges there as well. Um, please take a one minute each uh, and just uh, give me uh, what do you think. I'll start with Melvin again. I just think that uh, sure it's a, a big ambitious project and, and you know bring hope to Ethiopia. But without uh, the fact is the countries along the Nile, Sudan and Egypt are also uh, directly affected by it. Uh, no way can you think it's going to be 100% uh, successful for Ethiopia without consideration for Sudan and Egypt. So it absolutely mandates that these countries uh, negotiate, talk, communicate, agree on a strategy. I think that the dam could be something that could promote economic development for the Horn of Africa, for the whole region. And uh, for me, uh, that would be the, <clears throat> the successful outcome. But for Ethiopia to think that this is an Ethiopian decision by itself only can mean uh, more warfare, more conflict, more divisiveness for the people in the region. And as an African-American, I love Africans from Cape Town to Cairo. So I'm not gonna get pegged for any one specific country I want to see solutions that are going to benefit the entire region and, and, and benefit the continent of Africa. Riva? Yeah, hey, th thanks, um, Ledet. I'm going to respond for one minute on the, uh, on the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam. And I have to go back and just respond to something Tabawu said, and then I'll, I'll leave it at that. Again, I, um, I agree with uh, Mel in that this is a project whose impact on the sovereign of neighboring nations is much greater than the ambition of Ethiopia itself. And so it needs to be the subject of a conversation and it can't be a zero sum game. And Ethiopia can't control um, on its own the water flow that's gonna impact Sudan, it's gonna impact Egypt. There needs to be a solution. There needs to be a solution that includes not only the three nations, but the countries in the horn. And I think you had suggested something in the write-up you provided, Ledet, about um, you know, scientists should be brought in and engineers should be brought in and there should be a, a solution-based program that deals with the political considerations and the economic considerations of each country. So I would um, I, I would say, and again, you're not going to find support in this world of one country right now saying, you know, well, under the Trump administration, they just said, I side with Egypt, right? <laughs> not going to happen in this administration. And that was a misstep. And I think Mel and Tababu agree with me. So again, um, I'd agree that there needs to be a fora to have this discussion, not one that strips the agency of Ethiopia, nor puts a halt on project work because this is such a significant effort over a decade, but at the same time, people can um, ride on the solutions. A couple other things, just going back because I have to, and, and to Bolu, we all have our lanes, and I um, appreciate the, um, the misfortune that, um, that the colonial powers in America and the Cold War brought on the African continent, and I was, uh, I was there as well, but now as I look at where the continent is and I look at countries like Ethiopia and Sudan, I look at Tanzania, I look at Kenya, that um, it's, you know, the, the history weighs on people, but right now the challenge is leadership and the challenge is leadership to step up. And that's why I was enthused about the, um, the uh, offering of the uh, Nobel Prize to Ahmed Abi because he was a new generation of leader that was looking forward and not so constrained by the loyalties and the politics and the historical lanes that everybody had to stay in. And so I think leadership is critical. And I think what I um, am so positive about Ethiopia is it does have this young, dynamic civil society that drove the changes of 2018. 
and that they also have to find the space to be able to be accommodated in a multi-ethnic, um, democratic, peaceful country. And so, um, again, I think that if I would, um, if, if I would just suggest something to all the powers that be, whether they're in the Tigray region or Eritrea, whether they're in Addis and Asmara, wherever they are, is that um, you're not gonna find people who look at this as your side is best and my side is best. It's not a zero sum game, it's how do we accommodate. And he who proffers that position on the table at this time in our collective history coming out of COVID is he or she is the person that's gonna help define the success. And if you could stabilize the situation right now in the country and at the same time, look at a regional solution on the dam that as Tababu says, takes into consideration the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and how you support intra-Africa trade. You know, you turn a, a crisis into a unique opportunity that helps power continent going forward. My conclusionary comments over Ledet. It was three minutes, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Rivat. About one minute on the girl. Okay, uh, this is a big, complex issue for a minute, but I'll quickly say, first I'll agree with uh, Brother Melvin. As far as I'm concerned, as I, as I said, I'm an, an African-American, and Africa as a whole matters to me. So in, in, in terms of the Nile, the people of the Nile and that region have to have a fair and equitable share of the water. And it's a very uh, critical, critical resource and everybody and everybody has to benefit from it. That said, that said, it has to be anchored. This is Ethiopian sovereign rights and her resources, it's her natural resources. And she's been denied from the opportunity. By the way, if you look at the usage of the, the contribution of the, the water and the electricity in Ethiopia, the electricity in Sudan, the electricity in Egypt, and the water, the water access to water from the people of the region to from the Nile, you will be heartbroken. You know why that happened? Again, the British are the ones who set the agenda, the agreement in 1928. And the, the, the one before that, the external factors have shaped, left a time bomb. So we're still, we're still divided and fighting and bickering. So we have to start from the bigger picture. All the people of the Nile have to have a share, equitable, equitable uh, 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 share of the water, but it has to be equitable. It has to be given that right. Poverty, drought, Ethiopia has been denied. So it is Ethiopian sovereign, sovereign right. That has to be established. And there has to be fair, and everybody has to come to the table because everybody has to win. So those are the two things I can say. I, I really appreciate you uh, uh, joining us on Prime Media. This has been a very fruitful um, uh, message that you, you all have shared. I am very delighted. Mm -hmm.